is a creative part of the divine that makes unity appear as multiplicity. Innumerable <coughs> things, each with a name and form, but all a flux of the same energy. The mind sees unity and reports diversity, looks at the timeless and reports transience, making time, space, and causality the parameters to define separateness. The world of the senses does exist. The phenomenal world is not an illusion. The illusion is just the sense of separateness. Maya is the passing show. All created things dance and swirl in Maya's magnificent and capricious stage. They confuse the mind and they cause self-centered attachments. Beyond the mind is only one who merely witnesses Maya and remains in equanimity. Van Gogh said, losing my mind, I left my mind behind. I put my soul in my painting. It is such a canvas of the true self that makes for an immortal selfie. Lord Krishna showed Arjuna his supreme form, the whole universe, in dazzling and immense radiance, an eternal sacred splendor restoring light and life, bringing forth and then consuming all manifesting the infinite manifold and the infinite one. Emerson says, if the red slayer thinks he slays, or the slain thinks he slain, they know not well the subtle ways I keep and pass and turn again. They reckon ill who lead me out. When me they fly, I am the wings, I am the doubter and the doubt. That was a great reassurance to me because doubters remain within the radius of divine inclusion. Arjuna is now inspired by supreme faith, but he's also overawed. He cannot endure more of this powerful vision, but it leaves him seeking to understand more of life which seems and the soul which sees. The self is no longer an abstraction to him. And it is no longer about what he, Arjuna, should do in this situation. The song continues interviewing many melodies of liberation and bhakti to discern what binds and what liberates, of freedom that follows attachment, seeing the same Lord in every creature, the deathless in all that die, of selfless service for the good of all, renouncing the attachment to results and cultivating serenity, being incapable of ill will, not agitating the world or by it agitated, of love, of meditation, of total devotion to God and surrender to Krishna. Someone has already said the unreal never is, the real never is not. Discerning the real from the unreal leads to pure consciousness and to detachment, Santuan de la Cruz said, writing about detachment and other. He said, in order to arrive at possessing everything, desire to possess nothing. In order to arrive at being everything, desire to be nothing. In order to arrive at that which you are not, give up that which you are not. St. John adds, detachment would lead to a union with God because my deepest center is the location of the divine. Moving from Maya, Krishna's guise, to Krishna is the vice traveler's path. To enter Krishna, the never changing dwelling inside. Krishna says, once he knows me as I am, he enters me forthwith. God was ever at home. It's we who went out for a walk. <laughs> Clarified Meister Eckhart, the 13th century German mystic. Molana Rumi greatly referred the self annihilated 9th century mystic, Bayazid al Bistam. Bayazid, the first God intoxicated Sufi, said he had found God within himself and scandalized everyone by announcing 
Glory be to me, how great is my majesty. <laughs> Subtlety was not his calling. Once someone came to his door and asked, Is Bayazid in the house? He answered, Is there anyone in here but God? Another intoxicated Sufi, Al Halaj, also given to complete indiscretion, claimed An al Haq and the truth, and for refusing to recant, was brutally killed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they see God. In another intense encounter, encounter with divine reality, Bayazid says, I gazed upon him with the eye of truth and asked him, Who is this? He said, This is neither I nor other than I. There is no God but I. Then he changed me into his selfhood and said to me, I am dying through thee. There is no God but thou. Meister Eckhart said, the eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, one love. The knower and the known are one. The culmination of the spiritual path, Shankaracharya calls the attainment of Viveka. The grand insight, when seeing that all is Vasudeva, one becomes Vasudeva. The Bhagavad Gita's advice is simple, is difficult, is simple. <laughs> enter within, enter Krishna, enter Dharma. If this is done, then seeing that all is Vasudeva, one becomes Vasudeva. Arjuna becomes Krishna. The warrior becomes his own charioteer. I am the self in me and I am my beacon. Then finally Krishna tells Arjuna, now go do as you desire. It is then for Arjuna to decide what to do as it is for me. Jana Mithadma. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Can I? Uh, Mrs. Sudhi Kanti Tripathi is not only our academic coordinator, she is also the former ambassador of India to Spain. And I must also tell that uh, uh, many years ago she wrote a play, Kuruk, uh, Crying for Kurukshetra, and which was very successful in India. I would also like to invite now our chairman, uh, Dr. Kapil Kapoor, to conclude the session so that uh, there will be a question answer also. Yes. Is the time we finish? Uh, Namaskar. Uh, we ha I had a very, I mean, I can't say we, but I certainly had a very illuminating and very interesting session. And uh, we had uh, two papers, different from each other, but they belong to one separate category. And that the two papers, Sunay Kantiji and Professor Thompson, you see, they are uh, exegetical and they deal with the substantial ideas. I won't use the word theological because that would say even Sunay Kantiji is thinking in Christian terminology, but then more in terms of, uh, you know, religious uh, interpretation. I, you had uh, first listened to Professor Tripathi Ji, Radhavalaji, and uh, I, I got, a, got the idea for the first time that you see the, in modern Sanskrit literature, and I'm sure Professor Tripathi will explore other Indian literatures, that the Gita, Gita, Gita Yanra was, you know, recaptured in the 19th century and uh, that has been that has happened to various other not only yanris but also texts some proto texts you know of indian tradition intellectual tradition have been uh, living and uh, they live in uh, in either tikas or they live in uh, recontextualized retellings 
read and contextualize read readings in which uh, uh, Ravaji's uh, Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Madam's Gita was one such. And it was important because it uh, set a trend and several Gitas came to be written, came to be written subsequently. The interesting thing was the correlation between the form of the of Bhagavad Gita and uh, the, the, the Sanskrit Gita, the modern Sanskrit Gita, but also the inspiration of both the texts, a kind of a conflict which, uh, you know, breeds higher wisdom, yields higher wisdom, and not only the inspiration, but also the structure. You see, interestingly, Mahabharata had 18 Parvas, and uh, Bhagavad Gita had 18 chapters, and uh, 18 became a very important number structurally. So I think uh, that Gita, modern Sanskrit Gita also has 18 chapters, although the number of verses we have been informed is different. And another important observation was that he also wrote a Charitam. Charitam also is a very important form in Sanskrit and uh, obviously it's like again a kind of a revival of that form, a revival of the form. I'm not so familiar with the, but I certainly know that in Bangla, Charits have been composed even in modern times. So this accounts for the continuity and the ruptureless continuity, although Indian scholars are quite fond of, you know, fitting their literatures into the same framework. Without any ruptures, you know, Indian literature, the forms as well as themes have a continuity and they remain alive. And they remain alive both in the literate tradition, the learned tradition, and also in the popular tradition, more alive in the popular tradition than in the learned tradition. And therefore it's a very, very original, innovative, useful paper, Professor Party. thank you very much. And then we had Professor uh, Egerty's uh, bringing to life, bringing to a notice, what he said was unnoticed, Solomon's uh, kind of a kind of a tika commentary on uh, Bhagavad Gita, but uh, I suppose it went unnoticed because it was obviously uh, theologically inspired that it was uh, seen in, the, in that frame and uh, uh, tried the as a good exercise in comparative religious studies, comparative studies, but then you see it also once you do that, it also restricts your audience and restricts your, uh, the people who would be interested. But it was again something new, something informative and uh, I'm glad that Dr. Johnson came in because Dr. Johnson himself was quite pedantic. So I'm sure, you know, the, the quote was very appropriate for that book also as a title. And then we had uh, our great Professor Thompson who was chanting like a Brahmin priest, <laughs> I must say, reverberations, and I could see how, uh, what should I say, inspired he was. And uh, I could, sitting next to him, I could feel the vibrations. <laughs> and uh, I, I felt that I should push the chair a little away, lest I also stand up and start chanting. <laughs> but it was, it was very infect infectious and infective and it was a wonderful experience listening to you. Uh, he drew, he uh, located uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, linked them to two, two traditions, two. One was of course the internal Indian tradition, the Katha Upanishad he drew upon at length, also quoted Taitiriya and uh, that was one linkage. And uh, so showing that, uh, showing that Bhagavad Gita after all, you see, in our tradition, it's known as a, uh, in other uh, dimensions, it was Sangre, not Sangre Grantha, but a Samanvaya Grantha. You see, it brought together, it brought together uh, various uh, thought systems, various thought systems, primarily, primarily Sanatan thought system, but then also it had at the back of its mind, the composer of Bhagavad Gita, also had at the back of the mind, you see, the Buddhism, the Buddhist uh, emphasis on karma and uh, also 
the new emphasis on bhakti by the Puranas, by the foregrounding of the Devadas and all that. But it was very interesting that he, he linked it to the Upanishadic tradition and on the other side he linked it to St. John and the Bible and the Bible. And uh, you see, uh, the, his, uh, uh, I have one, uh, I mean, I, I, I will not have, I won't dare to, you know, disagree with him <laughs> at all. But I have some observation about, you know, you see, I think our Suryakanti ji also was using the word uh, uh, soul freely for Atman and also using the word illusion freely for Maya. I think both are inappropriate. And I think one problem with our uh, Indian studies by Indians, one problem is that we tend to translate our untranslatable terms into, you know, familiar, familiar vocabulary uh, in order to make sense to a particular audience. Because soul will make sense to English, English knowing, if you permit my bad English, English knowing uh, Indians, but will make no sense to people who don't know English in India, which are about 95% of Indians. And it has wrong associations because in no sense is Atman associated with sin. And uh, therefore, I would strictly recommend that I, we retain the term Atman and Atma when we talk about it and not use the word soul. In the same way, immense damage has been done to Adi Shankaracharya by one first English translator who translated uh, uh, Brahm Satya Jagat Mithya, Mithya as illusion. Now Mithya is not illusion, not at all. It's not illusion at all. In fact, Misa, Misa or Misna is a proto-Indo-European verb root, verb root. And you'll be amazed that in my mother tongue Punjabi, it is still used as a verb. It's still used as a verb. And it simply means a construction of the mind. Construction of the mind. Now, if you look at it properly, this word that we describe as this word, the language has a tendency that our uh, uh, propositional sentences, our propositional sentences, our uh, uh, B verb sentences, you know, they have a they have a kind of a tendency to be to look like statements of truth, statements of truth. So when we say something that this is wonderful, well, instead of I, uh, what I am saying is, I Kapil Kapoor says this is wonderful, but the other person may come and say, what's wonderful about it? <laughs> so in that sense. The world that each one of us talks about is our construct, our individual construct. The world, the world, the reality. The Hindu mind does not deny reality, that there is no reality or there is no truth. But the Hindu mind asserts that you cannot know, you cannot know. There is unknowability about reality and about truth. We can all approximate, we can all make statements about it, about it, but we cannot describe it, that this is it. It's impossible. The moment two, two perceivers, two egocentric particulars, uh, look at something, because they occupy a different space, they under, have a different understanding. They have a different understanding. And no two persons agree even on a cup of coffee. <laughs> the quality of a cup of coffee, not to speak of this world. Then same man in the morning says Bhartri Hari, 5th century. Same man in the morning may find some one meaning of good and in the evening find, feel another meaning of good. So the cognitions differ in the same individual. What about speaking of different individuals? In that sense, Brahma Satya, because Brahma it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it is unknowable. It is, it, you cannot see it, but it sees, you cannot hear it, but it hears. It is beyond our human knowledge. So there is one. But our thinkers, 
for thousands of years have tried to identify this crime, but they have been unable to. And they know that it is not able, not, not possible to. Not possible to. And then to translate Brahma's 